everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fashion Bunker and welcome to a new fragrance review. This one is very, very special for so many reasons. Today we are reviewing Balenciaga's Hoang, Hoang, or Hohang. Yes, the puns are endless, so be my guest. I shall try to pronounce this in the cleanest way possible for all the viewers out there. We have the double B Balenciaga logo on top, the old school one. We have the sticker on the glass bottle, the Eau de Toilette concentration, 100 milliliter Balenciaga Paris made in France. This background is a very airy and um, cottony, beautiful, almost countryside with its very clean pattern. Uh, texture structure. Um, I wanted a hue of beige and brown to go with this more red brown just to even though this fragrance has darker hues of red and brown in it there's a side to it that is also light in brown almost <clears throat> bordering to beige and also because it's about fading fading of colors fading and blending of genders as well this fragrance was released in 1971 and so this is, well, for, you know, now, today is 2019. This is many, many years after the release. I'm not even sure, to be honest with you, if this fragrance still exists. I have purchased my bottle um, nine years ago, back in 2010. But this one was already in a perfumery that uh, kind of deals with older fragrances. So... This one was at least five years old or even more, so I cannot really tell you how old this one is. I can tell you, however, that it smells delicious. Now, why is it so important? Let's spray it on first. There you go. Hmm. Hmm. Aldehydes and 70s chemicals. I'm loving it. And somebody who has really smelled 70s perfumes can know what this exactly means. It is a divine. Oh. oh my gosh, it's so intense. We're talking intensity, pre-reformulation era. We're talking fragrances that had the delivered a punch. Mind you, 1971, uh, you know, everybody was drinking all over the place, smoking all over the place. So there was a lot of smells in the air. So perfumes needed to counter that. But guess what is so groundbreaking about this one? Well, what is so groundbreaking and why I love this one so, so, so much is because it is one of the first fragrances in that 70s era, or in general, you could say one of the first fragrances, that pushed the genderless agenda. Yes, Hoang was the first fragrance of its kind to be promoted in France for her and for him. All the advertisement campaigns would state that this fragrance was for the lady and for the gentleman, for both of them. And most of the ad campaigns were um, either a man leaning on a woman, woman leaning on a man, either she's naked, he's naked, they're semi-dressed. It, it was a, there was a fluidity. It's a genderless fragrance. It's a fragrance for both. However, in 1971... Also going into 1972. By the way, this fragrance, like no other to me, smells of the 70s. It's incredibly reminiscent of the 70s. It's, it's a perfect time travel machine to the 70s. Um, not all of the world was ready for such a gender revolution. So in fact, if you see the vintage advertisement campaigns in Italy, very conservative country, 1971 in particular, also 1972, when I think this one was launched a bit later, um, it's as if they, whoever des decided to distribute it in Italy, joked extremely harshly uh, with the fact that this is a male fragrance. Now, I don't know if Balenciaga was forced with their ad campaign to classify this as a male fragrance rather than a unisex, but the ad campaigns literally, um, I'll see if I can blend in a photo of uh, of the of the ad campaign but what is so funny in in particular in one of these ad campaigns they state 
they basically list the concentrations available, or actually the sizes available of the fragrance. And as they list that, so I'm reading here from, um, on the side I have the, the image, it says, Hohang, eau de toilette, molto maschile, which means a very male. And they have Hohang, deodorant. And then they again write underneath that, very male. Then they state Hohang, savon de toilette, so the toilet soap or the bath soap. And under that, again, they reiterate molto maschile, very male. And then the funny thing, and this is where I understood, oh, okay, maybe Balenciaga, maybe, they were forced to classify this fragrance as male rather than genderless in Italy. So to make fun of it, on the fourth slot where they are advertising for their aftershave, they write Hohang, aftershave. And then in parenthesis, obviously. They just wrote obviously without writing that it's uh, very male. So um, then on top of that, uh, the text explains Hohang, l'aroma esotico dei legni d'Oriente, un profumo, come definirlo? Molto maschile. So it says the exotic aroma of Oriental woods, a perfume. How to define it? Very male. I mean, it's a joke. It's obviously a joke, and it's pushing boundaries in a way in a country that was still so close-minded back then. France was ahead of its time. I believe France is still ahead of its time when it comes to couture, at least, and hence, you know, also my opinions on uh, Italian uh, couturiers taking over haute couture uh, fashion houses of France. Example, Dior at the moment with Maria Grazia Chiuri, or what... Riccardo Tisci did to damage Givenchy in the past, but thank God he's out of that house. So, <laughs> you can start criticizing enough if you want. I really don't care. Let's get into the top notes of Hohang. Uh, we got lemon, bergamot, basil, lavender, and orange. Then we got the middle notes. We have the geranium, and here's a little twist. Now we're going to see in the mid notes something that usually lands in the bass notes, but it's so emphasized in the mid notes, and that would be the Brazilian rosewood, as well as cedar, as well as patchouli. And all of those three are rounded up in a balmy clove. That's so delicious, the clove. We're going to get to the clove in a minute. Bass notes see benzoin, musk, amber, vanilla, tonka bean, and labdanum. Now, the clove is an ingredient nowadays quite rare in, in mass-released fragrances. Here, I'm smelling it. it um, in the mid-notes, it delivers a, a punch, not to the nose, but rather to all of the more metallic citrusy notes that open the fragrance in a very 70s way, almost like aldehyde type of 70s way, a citrusy tone together with a very metallic lavender, a fragrance would kind of open itself up to the world. That, that's a, a classic early 70s way of formulating. So the clove, uh, the clove delivers a punch to that lavender Together with the patchouli, but the patchouli here is very toned down. It's not a patchouli that you're going to sense out. It's This fragrance is not about the patchouli. I think the patchouli is there just because, well, we're just done with the the whole hippie movement. I mean, it's still happening in some parts of the world, but uh, the late 60s have passed, and we still have a reminiscence of it. And there's a reminiscence of it inside of Hohang as well. But 1971 is more the time of specificity, less chaos and more definition within design. So that's why we're seeing the rise of designers such as Werner Panton, who in already in the late 60s, but especially in the early 70s, defined an entire generation of, um, of style. This perfume caters to that elegance. From chaos, we are, by the way, chaos is also really beautiful. The late 60s are an incredible time as well as, as was the hippie movement, but it's as if the early 70s start bringing into shape the past. And fragrances also seem to 
be analytical of that. Ho Hang has learned from the past, has learned from the 60s movements, the, the freedom movement, and it's telling us, okay, I have learned, well, Balenciaga, the brand has learned, and we are now delivering a unisex fragrance. We are cutting that boundary. Marketing-wise, we are deleting that boundary. We are now free. Anybody's free to use this fragrance. And boy, is it interesting to smell this one on female skin and on male skin. Because even on myself, and this is again, this is why we get to this clean cotton, organic cotton, by the way, shirt. Um, it, sometimes if I were to wear it, uh, let's say on a Sunday afternoon to go out to brunch or whatever, and you wear a clean cotton shirt, it doesn't need to be white, but it can be, it has to be a cotton it can give you that feeling of wearing the shirt that your boyfriend or girlfriend wore the day before. So you're wearing your girlfriend's or your boyfriend's shirt the next day. Usually the visuals I know for us is usually would say you're wearing the boyfriend's shirt because they're usually bigger and you kind of envelop yourself in it. But whatever, you could wear the girlfriend's shirt too. Why not? Sometimes it gives me those vibes. Other times it gives me a very powerful business vibe. It almost makes me feel like I can go to any business meeting, conquer whatever plane there is out there or field and just slay. You know what I mean? Just completely slay. No matter what what it is I have to slay. It, it just makes me feel like I can go for it. It's that refreshing and energetic. Then there are times, especially in the opening notes, um, where I feel very strong nostalgia, very strong nostalgia for even earlier fragrances because there's a metallic sort of aldehyde opening. This one sometimes even takes me back to the 20s. As I'm smelling it now, in this particular uh, studio setup scenario uh, with a particular type of heat, I can even tell you that the Brazilian rosewood, the labdanum and um, geranium together. Oh my God, my mouth is watering. They're so delicious. They create such a powerful floral amusement park with a lot of bright red colors um, within a scenario of autumn leaves, but there's heat. It's almost as if we're now we're in Australia, you know, they have summer when the North hemisphere of the planet has winter and vice versa. It's as if you're in both places at the same time with this one. It's like you are in Australia enjoying the summer breeze while at the same time being in Paris in the middle of winter uh, wearing, a, wearing an incredible soft but warm cashmere coat. Um, it bounces off of memory. It's a very memory-oriented fragrance. It's a fragrance that makes you travel and it's just that beautiful and i don't i pro i don't know if they really still produce this one i haven't seen it in ages in perfume stores um and pr it's probably been reformulated mm, the smell is so amazing and then at times it smells really you know as much as we hate to classify and date fragrances it smells old-fashioned Many way, in many ways, depending on what you wear and how you go about yourself in society, it can be very dated. It can smell as if you made a mistake. It, it's as if you, you flew in from another time and you're in the wrong time now. But it keeps you guessing, nevertheless. 1971 is a very special year. I'm going to show you something very special from my collection. Here goes. My favorite singer of all time, Mina, an Italian singer. This album is called Del Mio Meglio, of my very best. She made, I think, nine of these throughout the years. It's kind of a collection of her best hits or live performances. And this is a vinyl record of her first, the best of Mina, or of my best. And this is the vibe of the 70s. There's a nostalgia, there's that kind of sadness in the air. She was one of the first singers that would shave her eyebrows and paint them very heavily to give even more of that feeling of sadness and nostalgia and just energy. And then you open this uh, vinyl record in a very different way than you would other uh, records. So as you open it, there's it's a fourfold. You see Mina's head and then you have this kind of ancient... And this is, again, the fragrance 
Ho Hang, totally delivers this vibe of nostalgia. Both were released the same year, by the way, the, this album and this fragrance. Traveling back in time. Here we have, an, so on the cover, 1971, Mina, her face, while she's performing. Then we have, stated at the bottom of this record, it says, um, the reproductions of the clothes used in this album are um, taken from postcards from the past. So this is a 30s, probably, postcard. They have cut off the head and they've placed Mina's head playfully. So now we have a 30s vibe. But it also is very 70s to go back into the 30s. Then as we open this fold, we discover a new outfit. This is even before the 20s, 20s, the, 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 the 10s. Here's Amina in the tens, beautiful pose as well. Same head though, same moment in time. She's in 1971, but the whole vibe and emotion is traveling through time so quickly. And then we open it up here. We have, I think this is, well, this could be the 1912 maybe, I'm not so sure. But here's another old school vibe and look, look at these shoes. Incredible. Anyway, this is another look and then we open the fourth panel to see actually the future we see the now and this is very space age very minimalistic almost utilitarian in a way but these like crepe de chine we have these almost like chinese crepes happening uh, let me see if we can when you see her head you can't see the whole look there let's slide it you have those gorgeous little shoes almost like sandals because they are they have perforations there's like a, mm, this could be what I, I'm not so sure what, what, what outfit this is. Pucci would be more colorful. Courage would be more minimal. Uh, but a lot of people would design just for her. Also television. Uh, a lot of the costumes would be made just for her television performances. Not necessarily branded. But what a beautiful woman. Let's turn her over like this so you see the full look. There you go. And And then that would be... The future, so they would combine past with the future, and that is what Hohang is as well. The fragrance that blends all of that together. And it's incredible that I actually have this record and this fragrance both released the same year. And then when you take off the panel, the last thing we see in here is the actual vinyl. Back then it didn't do, you know, they didn't do printed image vinyls or, you know, it was just black vinyl, very classic. And then you have the inscription. Here's a couple of the songs from side A. And then you have side B. And then you have etched in here the actual date when this uh, vinyl was pressed. The 29th of March, 1971. Okay. Let me put this back properly in its place. This is also part of the Fashion Bunker archives, not just fragrances and fashion, but also music. And this one is very, very fragile and delicate. You can see it's falling apart on the sides already. So, a very precious piece. So not everything in particular in Italy, if we're talking about Mina, the Italian singer, who already in the late 70s moved to Switzerland, she couldn't handle Italy anymore. She was just too annoyed by it and uh, has lived there ever since. She still lives in Switzerland. She is now also a Swiss citizen. Um, so what I wanted to say in the 70s, not everybody had such closed mentality uh, as Italy had, uh, because also in Italy, there were people with a very open train of thought. And I'm saying this in particular, given the situation we're living in right now, it's as if history is repeating itself. Italy is once again, in a terrible state. But you know that I don't like to talk too much about politics uh, or not at all on this channel, uh, but fragrances, and this is something fascinating, are always connected to politics. What does this mean? Well, let's take uh, Guerlain, for example. Here's a little bottle. We have this B shapes, uh, by the way, Samsara, Eau de Parfum, and also the Eau de Toilette. You could check out the review of these fragrances also on my channel. Link is in the description down below. Be sure to check these out because I do talk about Napoleon III and Eugenie, for whom this particular bee bottle by Guerlain was designed for. So be sure to check out that review. Uh, link will also be at the end of this video in the card section. So as you can see, if even bottles 
are designed for certain personalities and personas that have that are within a political context, that means that when we are smelling something, we're looking at the bottle as well, we have to understand as much as we can of the context. Where are they coming from? Why? When were they produced? What does that time mean? If we really want to understand the smell, or we could just limit ourselves to the mere and pure smelling of something on our skin and saying whether or not we like it passively, without understanding anything about where these fragrances are coming from in terms of context, idea, and production. Because a lot of time does go into creating a fragrance. Once the formula is set in stone, they can start producing it more or less, depending on the ingredients, of course, more or less quickly and en masse. But coming to the point of actually saying, we are ready, let's release this, that takes time. And the idea of developing a unisex fragrance for 1971 is revolutionary, even though we know that fragrances know no gender. Still revolutionary to push the concept through marketing, believing that that type of marketing will benefit the sales of a fragrance, in particularly in France. Now, a couple of years after, when the fragrance was still uh, in production and new ad campaigns were released, it was no longer advertised as unisex. It wasn't advertised as any gender at all, or it was gender uh, marketed towards men. So let's smell it again. It has the intense rose punch. The geranium and the clove, the lavender, the labdanum, the amber, hint of vanilla, they're all there. And they're so masterfully playing with each other. None of them defines the other more or less. They keep very, in a very wise way, you know, it's very grown, very mature way, very evolved way. In a very evolved way, they keep giving each other the space. None of them is overpowering the other, hence very unisex. There is no man dominating over the woman. And there is no woman having to struggle for her position in a man-made, man-dominated world. All the ingredients harmonize. The blend is just that good. Now, today you would probably utilize more of the synthetics and more modern-day synthetics, so there would be less of that metallic touch like a dusty heft, dusty heavy powdery touch. There would be less of that today. This fragrance would be more doughy, it would be more like a Play-Doh type of feel. Like a lot of, most of the fragrances that I've smelled in my experience that are reformulated from 60s, 70s releases uh, to today, they, also 80s, 90s in some cases, today's reformulations have a play doughy. Uh, note to them. Biggest example is Hypnotic Poison. The Eau de Toilette has a Play-Doh-y feel that the original 90s version didn't have. I'm sure this one would get that Play-Doh-y feel as well because certain natural ingredients would not be usable anymore today uh, or the way that they would extract certain ingredients with chemicals and synthetics would just not be extracted the same way today. There will be a different process. So it is very time specific. And in that respect, I say that it delivers an early age of perfumer, of modern day perfumery. I mean, early 70s. It smells like a 70s fragrance. What can I tell you? It's not that timeless, but it is timeless if you analyze it within the context of what came after, all the way through to today. This one is timeless because it still owns its own place. It's still powerful in its own position. It becomes timeless because we need this as a reference point to understand further development in perfumery and smells. We need to know that this one existed. Best is even to know how this one smells or how it smelled because one day this one won't be available anymore either or might already be discontinued now. And it's just wonderful to see that people were already back then working 
on the concept of breaking those boundaries between genders, making it clear that fragrances are for everybody, uh, but not being afraid at the same time to give a fragrance character. CK1 was advertised as the biggest uh, unisex fragrance. And as good as it smelled in the 90s, it was a citrusy, simple concoction. It, it was... Mm, it didn't have strength of character. It had a very defined character, but it wasn't as strong as Ho Hang is. Ho Hang is very, very strong. It's very, very powerful. I mean, the musk, the amber, the benzoin, the vanilla, the tonka bean, the labdanum. And this is just the base notes. Then we got the Brazilian rosewood, the cedarwood, the patchouli, the geranium, the clove. And this is in the mid note. This is, it's a lot. And you would think, oh my gosh, this is a mess. But no. All that dust settles down on that wooden floor that is centuries old. And we decide to put furniture in that, on that wood inside that big old ancient room. And that furniture is maybe from Werner Panton and it is 70s for back then, modern. Actually, Space Age. 1971 is the epitome of Space Age. It already began in the 60s, but it's... Prime time was the 70s, in fact, because that's when the evolution arrived to a point where you could say space age is very defined by now, and then they could have moved on. And then slowly we went into all those other things. Like, for example, all of this enabled a little movie that nobody really knows called Star Wars. Happened late 70s. It was all a progression that led up to that point where the masses were ready for such a revolution, a vision of the future. In fact, this little jewel is also like a lightsaber. It's like holding a lightsaber and it feels almost like one, like a pre-lightsaber time. It also smells like something that could be definitely worn in the first Star Wars movie, A New Hope. In fact, Ho Hang is like a character from Star Wars. Uh, it does deliver A New Hope. It was a wonderful time. We are in the disco era as well, or slightly pre-disco era. But in some cases, in big cities, there was already... Everything happens ahead of time in the big cities anyway. And the way that the ad campaign was styled for Ho Hang already had, from the makeup to the hair, to the voluptuousness, it already had the disco in its heart. Uh, so this is a vision of the future, 70s way of seeing the future, and for a fragrance that was envisioning a future, but staying very true to its own time, the 1970s, this one is very modest that way, because it's honest and modest, and it delivered a wonderful character. So I'm very, very humbled, actually, to be able to own this and to review it, because it just is that special. It just is one of those cosmic keys that unlocks a door to the past, and it lets you travel. Well, the past... In the time I'm talking now, this might be the past. In another time, I might be talking about the future. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, please do thumb it up and let me know what you think about the video and also about Ho Hang in the uh, comment section down below. Also, thumb up the video if you liked it and subscribe to my channel here on YouTube if you haven't already. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, Super Deco Ball spelled together. I'm also on Patreon, Super Deco spelled together, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank all my patrons for pledging and helping the channel grow. Without your help, nothing would be possible. Also, if you wish, write me to askdeco at gmail.com questions and ideas and thoughts or topics you want to talk about for an opportunity to get to call me live in studio and talk to me in one of my videos that are coming out soon. You could also check out the first episode of Ask Jacob also on my channel. Link is in the description box down below. Check that out right now. Otherwise, you can also follow the link at the end of this video in the card section. Until next time, be sure to never forget to never give up on love, and I'll see you soon. Bye.